Welcome to the Beyond X podcast. I'm your host, Mahir Abrahimi, and every week I speak to leading industry experts, trailblazers, and market leaders, where we discuss the key topics of our time in detail and have a deep dive conversation on areas like sustainability, technology, urban planning and city design, health and fitness, and more. In today's episode of Beyond Tech, I spoke with Manoj Akarwal. In the first part of our discussion, we focus on addressing the various fears surrounding AI, on jobs and the future of work, the security challenges of AI systems, the security fears of the use of AI by bad actors, and the limited transparency and accountability of AI systems and platforms. In the second part of our discussion, we delve deeper into the future of AI by talking about artificial general intelligence, a super intelligent AI and the singularity, and the fears of a world ending super AI. We then focus on the more positive side of things and touch on the potential benefits of super AI and explored concepts like multimodal AI, the emergent abilities of AI, and if an AI can ever possess emotions or even a soul. The different discussion points are all timestamped throughout the episode, so you can freely move around as you see fit. Minuch is a global thought leader in the field of artificial intelligence and data science, holding an impressive four patents specifically in AI. He's the founder and chief innovation officer of Tetra Noodle Technologies, a data science and AI consulting company he founded nearly 25 years ago. His past clients include the likes of Microsoft, IBM, Pearson Education, and more. Through his consultancy, Manuj has guided startups and industry giants alike across various industries, including fintech, edtech, retail and e-commerce, health tech, real estate, manufacturing, and more. And his personal journey is an especially interesting one, having started off at a $2 an hour factory job to now brushing shoulders with some of the biggest names in technology. So it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for taking the time. Great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. Pleasure to have you with us. Okay. I have a lot of topics to discuss, but I think before we get into the technical nitty gritty, I really want to tap into your backstory of how you move from a factory worker to doing what you are doing, working with some of the biggest companies in the world, especially focused on AI and the advanced technologies. So give me an understanding of how that became a reality. What moved you toward AI specifically? What kind of intrigued you about this sector? When the story started as I was 15, I had to figure out something to do at that age to be able to afford even basic stuff like my education. I was working in the factory, but one day I realized looking at some of these business magazines that there is more to the world. Like you can achieve much more by reading the inspirational stories of other entrepreneurs. And so that triggered in my mind that I need to create some value, something that can elevate me from my position as a factory worker making two dollars a day to something more and at that point i was trying to look for what could it be and internet was just coming along and computers were just becoming popular so i found myself enrolled in a computer programming course and i just really fell in love with programming and i knew that is what i was going to do Mm -hmm. Uh, and then as uh, things progressed in life a lot of things unfolded I was going through this technology wheels, helping a lot of startups build their products, a lot of Fortune 500 companies, not a lot, a handful of them, but building large scale systems that always pushed me to look for projects where you can use technology to create a big impact on large populations, maybe in healthcare, maybe in education. So these type of projects are really interesting. And then another dimension of keeping ahead is utilizing latest technology. So whenever there is a new technology introduced, especially for engineers who enjoy work, geeky engineers like myself, we always try to play with a new technology, like a new toy. So artificial intelligence falls into that category. Artificial intelligence has been around since the 70s. I started working with it around 2007. And I've been working on it for about 15 to 16 years to solve some really challenging and interesting problems. In, in healthcare and education. Sounds great. That's very interesting though. I mean, I love when you say to the geeky stuff, it's like you're speaking to, <laughs> exactly to me mm-hmm. and I'm hoping to quite a few of the listeners. But it's so true. It's just the possibilities are endless. It's almost yeah. like whatever we can imagine can be done with AI. There could potentially be a use case, if not today, eventually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But 
I'm always a glass half full kind of person. I think there's a lot of people who are a bit more pessimistic or afraid of AI. There's a lot of fears going around these days. Some say it's sparked by the letter, the moratorium letter, if you want to call it, that Elon Musk and some other experts in your industry put forward. But I think this has been a fear that's been with us for a long time. There's movies that kind of iRobot, The Matrix, they sort of put that idea into our minds. Before we dig into each of the aspects of this, what are your overall thoughts on this? Should we be scared of AI? Where do you stand on this overall debate? I've been having so many conversations about this with a lot of people and few themes that come up. One is that it will take away a lot of jobs, right? So that is a big fear. And I feel like, yes, there's going to be job displacement, but I feel like every new technology wave creates new jobs. And that's where most people argue, oh, this time it's going to be different. But I believe we are not even sure what will be the definition of work. Because let's say we need, like we are so comfortable that all our physical needs are met, but we need somebody to listen to us. That could be a job worth, even today, therapists get paid tons of money just to listen. So these kind of jobs may really alter based on the socioeconomic climate that is created by the use of AI. So let's not be mistaken that only physical activity, jobs, or producing something tangible is a job. It could be something more emotional at an emotional level. So that's one thing. So the second thing people are afraid of is AI taking over the world and killing humanity. So <laughs> that comes from the Terminator movie, right? Now to that, what I say is that if we consider every war, that has been started by humans. It's a result of generational trauma, jealousy, hate, these kind of really deep emotional scars that erupts in war. And now if AI is considered another species, somebody will have to be so in tune with themselves that they understand technology as well as human nature so well, they can create an algorithm which simulates generations of trauma and generations of hate, which will then tell the AI to plan for it, killing another species. It's just absurd to me. Yeah, you made me think and that the trauma aspect, it's so true. It's almost, we think automatically of destruction and war because that's our history. Yeah. That's yeah, humanity yeah. in a nutshell, right? We don't even know how many times the world had to restart itself because we destroyed it. Exactly. But that's such a good point. Yeah, there's no certainty. Just because we think that way that the AI is going to do the exact same thing. Yeah. I want to definitely I tap more into that. And then when people say, oh, all these people like Elon Musk are saying, stop it. Elon Musk may have different ideas because of different reasons. Because he, of all people, have invested the most. His future depends the most on AI. Data is everything to Tesla, to SpaceX. Without AI, without data, those rockets are not going to right. land perfectly back on land. It's all AI. And for him to say, oh, stop AI is, there are other motives behind the themes that people don't right. read. And then the other aspect is the headlines that we read are themselves controlled by AI and they are optimized to utilize the most sensationalized headlines. So true. It's the cycle that if people understand it, then they say, oh, if we don't use AI, we are screwed. Yeah, because it's drama, right? It's things that are existential that create a fear or enhance the motion that we're more likely to read and being afraid of AI is going to more likely tell us to read. So it's almost the AI is feeding us these stories itself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now that's maybe something to be afraid of too, the impact exactly. and advent of AI in social media. But that's so yeah. true. I, I love the way you put that holistically. It yeah. makes perfect sense. I want to start with the first thing you talked about. So jobs. It's, I think, the biggest fear that a lot of people have. It's probably the most realistic fear, if you will, of all the fears that you just phrased yourself. And it's the one that, it's almost the most difficult if you ask me to prepare for, because yes, we are evolving, right? This is, we're past even the fourth industrial revolution, but we're evolving into what technology can enable us and we can leverage technology to do for us. And I think a lot of times people were saying back in the day when cash tellers were being moved out and ATMs were coming to view and it was, like, oh, this is going to destroy this industry. Do we want to now wait in a queue again to get our cash from the bank where we can just put our card and get our money in 30 seconds max, we're done, right? And there's a camera and everything is secure and all of that beautiful stuff. So I think that evolution is logical. But like you said yourself, a lot of people are saying, no, this is different. This is going to be coming for different kinds of jobs. And 
I think in the beginning of the AI discussion, we were talking about like long haul truck drivers and cashiers in shops and restaurants, they would be replaced. Now we're talking about with chat GPT and generative AI. Okay. Copywriters are going to be replaced. Coders are going to be replaced. At least technical coders are going to be replaced. And lawyers could potentially be replaced. Our very first episode, I spoke with Dr. Professor Derek Woodgate, and he was saying that it's not so much that these people will be replaced. Yes, some of these aspects will be replaced and changed to AI. Some people will try to do the cheapest thing. So instead of hiring a copywriter, they will go to ChatGPT and say, write me copy. But it's not going to be great. And I think if you don't have the technical capacity to understand what great and bad look like, you're not going to be able to fix that. If you're getting this garbage in, you don't know what it is. You're like, oh, this is gold. But that's not always the case. And I think what he really highlighted was that it's not that Lawyers, for example, we replaced. It's the lawyers who don't tap into ChatGPT to do their research and to do their grunt work that will be replaced. Exactly. So it can kind of help us do three, four times this work. I see you're nodding. So what are your thoughts on this? What do you think the sort of ramifications are? And maybe expand a bit more on what you were saying about how this is going to revolutionize the way we think of work. Yeah. So let's think about any technologies. When automobile was invented, like 1920s or something like that, there was a huge horse cart industry everywhere. And when the automobile was invented, like everybody was worried, like it was a huge industry. What was going to happen to all these horses, the people who take care of the horses, clean up the stuff and fix their nails in the hooves and all that. But the point is that all those people got employed in automobile industry at much higher wages. Again, when internet was a thing, before that, there was no such thing as a website developer. Then the uh, smartphone came, there was right. new jobs like app developers were created. What will happen is that some people, and this is a part of how human beings adopt new technology, then innovators, they are like a handful of people, like 2-3% of the population. They are going to start adopting AI and they are going to start getting better and better. And then the a few 10% or 12% of the population will look at that competition and say, oh, they are doing so much better. I should catch up to them. They'll right. start adopting AI. So this is, this, these waves of adoption happen in every industry, every geography, and it's called diffusion of innovation. So it's the scientific theory. So it, every technology is adopted to that rate. So now what will happen is people who refuse to move along. So let's say the first wave of adoption happens, second wave happens. And if they don't catch up by the third wave, they are going to be forced out of business or job, and they will need to settle for lower level jobs. And this happens even today. There's so many jobs that used to be relevant and they are not relevant anymore. For example, when you go to old buildings, there used to be a lift operator, a person mm -hmm. sitting there pressing the buttons. And now in many, you don't even have the button. You just have a card and then you don't know where to go. So these kind of jobs disappeared, but then these people upskilled and got other jobs. And that's what's going to happen now as well. And the definition of job, the way that I look at the world is we are living in an era where our cognitive ability and thinking ability is rewarded. Mm -hmm. Starting from the caveman days where somebody said, okay, I want to kill a big animal so that I can rest for 30 days and eat. So they had to invent the lever and figure out technology to kill a big elephant. And so whoever could think of solutions, they were rewarded. But now machines can do more thinking and deeper thinking. So we are going to be moving into more emphasis on the emotional side of human existence because the thinking can be offloaded to the machine so what is left is the emotion there will be jobs where emotions will be rewarded like creative jobs in the renaissance period musicians craftsmen painters sculptors they were the considered the top of the society they were rewarded the most so we have been through these periods of history where the emotional side becomes more important and i think that's what we will see at least for the foreseeable future. And that's what can be regarded the definition of work. Because today, <laughs> frankly speaking, if a young person goes to his or her parents and says, okay, I want to be a painter, I don't think their parents right. will be very pleased about it, you know? Right. It's not yeah. considered work. Yeah, this generation's version of that is TikTok, right? Oh, I yeah, want to exactly. be a TikTok star. And even yeah. that, if you think about it, 
now we can automate that too to some degree. Yeah, I think. Ex exactly, exactly. So many people, given the opportunity, they want to do whatever activities that require very little work from them. They just post a few pictures here and there, post a few videos and they get money. Oh, yeah. So do we really need to work? Does, do we really want to work? Is it an inherent requirement for humanity? Maybe we just, if the robots did all the work for us and we were just fed, do you think that would be enough for us? Now we are getting into the metaphysical part of the discussion. The way that I look at the universe is basically humans are creating, they are always imagining the next step. When one problem is solved, we find another problem. We are curious. So let's say we have solved all the major problems. Climate change is okay. We found the cure for cancer. Do you think like people who retire, they just sit down and then do nothing. Like they get curious, they read books, they they have time to spend with family. Those are meaningful things. Now, the thing is, we just don't value that, value that activity as much because we have more important things to do. But when those things are taken care of, then we have spare time to devote to these other efforts. And yeah, things will change in, from that respect. So... Essentially, you do agree then that AI will be different with how it displaces jobs compared to past evolutions and even revolutions in technology like the internet. It will be, but I don't think it will be so abrupt that people will say, okay, I, today I have my job, tomorrow I don't. It will transition just like any other technology has transitioned. In 1990s, the internet came along and if you ask a person, hey, do you need an email address? Would you like a website? They'll be like, what what's a website? I have yellow pages, right. so I'm good. But today you cannot function without a website. But it happened slowly. We didn't notice like one day you didn't need a website. You hear multiple people say, oh, where, what's your website address? And then you're forced to think everybody's asking for it. So I better get on with it. Yes, this adoption will happen, but it's not going to be like so abrupt that people will be in shock. They will be given enough opportunity to understand it, learn, adapt it, and then become good at it. Okay. And when we're thinking of the future of jobs, what do you think firstly will be the jobs that will not change that much or like we will still need them irrespective of how far AI gets? And what new jobs do you think will come to be because of AI? Like you mentioned web designers, for instance, and social media designers. What's the equivalent of that for AI? I think jobs where you need personal touch, listening, like doctors, even if everything is done by machines, they need to provide the moral supports. Even the human touch or presence can help make a difference between somebody getting well or not. So those kind of jobs will stay. Again, education will be another one because no matter how smart the machines get, we will always need to learn. And we can only learn from experienced people. There's a, the machines can augment the learning but cannot replace humans. And then I believe what will also happen is we will start to see different classes of activities, businesses, meaning some people will say, okay, I want to go to an authentic human. Just like today we say, oh, we have organic food and we have non-organic food. So we may th start to look at services and products and saying, okay, produced by AI or produced by humans. We could say, okay, I want to go to a restaurant, but I don't want to deal with any of the servers or anything. I'll go to a fully mechanized AI based restaurant or some people will say they're machines doing everything we have lost the touch with humans in this society so how about an authentic human 100 percent human experience so those kind of things will start to and that will be interesting to to see as well that's so true the second example is a really good one because even now you have handmade shoes for example yeah, that yeah. sell for so much more than a factory made shoe yeah. designer bags that are hand stitched persian carpets that are hand sewn. Saffron yeah. is the most expensive spice in the world because you have to hand pick it. Yeah, exactly. The machine can. I mean, maybe nanotechnology will allow some of these things to change, but yeah. at the moment it can. That makes perfect sense. I think that's an interesting yeah, yeah. way to look at it. When we're talking about jobs, if someone wants to say prepare for their future, so five, 10 years down the line, if you're telling your kids, okay, you should do this job, so that you'll be successful no matter what the AI revolution brings. Do you have any suggestions? I will say, get better at asking questions. The reason is, let's take any science fiction movie where you have the most advanced robotics AI. Let's take Star Wars. So you have R2-D2 and CPO. And 
they are very smart, but still they need to be given orders. You do this and you do that. That's prompt engineering. That's a human telling them what to do, asking them questions. Okay, what's happening around me? What is the best action I can take? So you do that. So if you start getting better at asking questions and communicating, you will start to form that foundation to be able to work with these machines as they start to come up in the future. Because at the end of the day, no matter how automated the world becomes, humans will still drive that. We will be still asking the questions to the machine and saying, okay, do this for me, do right. this for me. So that's one skill. And that's saying, learn communication. In, in, in today's world, we say, hey, learn <laughs> to communicate. So if you can learn that, I think that will take you much further ahead than any other technical skill. That's an interesting one because you could even apply that now, right? Prompt generation for ChatGPT. I've had people telling me, oh, ChatGPT is so useless. I asked it to do this and this, and it just, it has no idea what it's doing. And I'm like, no, you got to keep going back to it. Like, <laughs> press regenerate. If it doesn't do it right, ask it to fix it. It can do things. It's literally garbage in, garbage out. So if you're saying ChatGPT is useless, it's because you're asking it to do things <laughs> useless. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or you're exactly. asking it in a useless way, but it is what you give it. And I think, I try to do as much of my work through it as I can. And you got to go back to it. It's not the smartest. Sometimes it gets something perfectly. And then the second time gets it completely wrong. And you got to say, no, use the previous response. And that's what it is. So I think that's a really interesting thing. It's the future, especially as long as generative stays the way, right? Do you think AI will come to a place where it can just prompt itself to do everything it wants and we don't need to think about it? Will, it see, the thing, the thing is, that is where I believe we are headed. Because at the end of the day, Let's take an example of the existing industry, financial transactions, stock exchanges throughout the world. 90% of the trades are done by machines between each other. Right. The only 10% are done by human beings, right? So it, the world's economic system is already controlled by robots, by AI. So now let's take social media, content, propaganda, all of this stuff. We know the distribution platforms like Google News, Facebook, Twitter, they are already AI algorithms. Now AI algorithms are going to produce the content. So now again, we are heading into a world where AI is going to fight the AI battle to see what, whose right. attention we can get more. So the humans are going to become more and more passive observers of what AI is doing in the world. And whoever controls and understands the algorithm and understand what impact it is going to have on the population, that will be the winner. That's so interesting. It's almost going to be the point where now we're fighting for eyeballs and attention. AI is going to create all the content, disseminate all the content. The next thing is the AI is going to be the consumer of the content too, I think. Exactly. We, and we then just the other thing the is, yeah, exactly. And you have to determine another factor here. The amount of eyeballs are limited. This AI can explode to a thousand percent, but the amount of eyeballs are finite. Eight billion people, 24 hours. That's it. That's the currency. So these AI algorithms will just need to fight for that amount of attention. And that, that will be the currency. Now the currency is changing as well. It's going to be attention rather than like dollars and bills. That's so interesting. It's almost like the matrix uses humans for energy and now it's using us for our eyeballs and attention. Yeah, financially. Exactly. That's crazy. Okay, I think we could keep talking about this for hours. So let's, let's move to some other topics as well. So we were talking about fears of AI. I think another big one is always security. I think there's a lot of ways to look at this. So let's start off with the security of AI systems and AI connected systems. Obviously, when something is connected to the AI, it could potentially be more vulnerable. That's a fear that at least a lot of people have. Again, when you connect things to IoT, for example, there's a whole debate on IoT security. But when you're just talking about AI, especially given the fact that we actually rely on AI to catch those breaches and problems, and especially given the number of data breaches and security hacks that we're seeing more and more of lately, where the organizations don't even know at the time, definitely don't tell people, but don't know at the time or don't find out for months later that, oh, somebody went in and stole all this data and took all this user data. What are your thoughts on this? How do we prepare for this? What's the next step on this specific angle? See, once again, to answer these very futuristic questions, we can just look at regular history. So as we go through different periods in history, you will notice that 
the commodity which is precious changes. At one point, England invaded the world for food spices. They just wanted right. spices. Like that, that. They invaded the entire world just to make sure that they had enough spices. It's a joke, but it is true. At another point, salt was a very important commodity. In some countries, sugar, cane became very important commodity. Then gold, silver, diamonds, platinum. So the commodity that is precious changes. Oil, oil became important. Right. So now data is becoming that precious commodity. So when a precious commodity is stored somewhere, there are going to be people wanting to steal it. It's no different than any other commodity. Now, when people want to steal it, we have to put strong locks, strong safes. We have to protect our property. And this is no different than any other period in time. The only thing is people complain because they don't want to understand what the lock is. They don't want to buy the lock. They just want to complain. But mm. when they go to, here is the funny thing. When the same person goes to Starbucks or airport, they are happy to plug in their free Wi-Fi, which is a public Wi-Fi. You know, right. all their data is going through this public yeah. Wi-Fi to save a few dollars. And then they go complain, oh, what is happening with my data? Why are these AI algorithms not secure? So it's all about whether you get along with the trend and understand the technology and then say, okay, this is the world we live in. We need these locks. We need to understand this basic stuff or we need to work with some experts. That's the way it is always going to be. Bad guys, good guys. Bad guys, good guys. Yeah, because data is a commodity. That's so true. That's completely accurate. You mentioned good guys and bad guys. So what about the fact that AI can help, let's call it the bad guys, black hats. They want to use AI to basically create more sophisticated cyber attacks, to automate their hacking, automate the DOS attacks that they're doing, or ransomware attacks that they're doing, or make altogether new forms of attacks that maybe they're limited right now, but with the use of AI, they can manage. Absolutely. Th th that will happen and it's happening right now, even in the past. In the 1980s, I remember watching some movies, people used to hack telephone lines to make long distance calls for free. Right. The idea is that if I go into philosophical idea about capitalism, we have limited resources and people are always fighting for those resources. So if everybody is given an opportunity to have those resources, we will have less of a problem with adopting technology or AI. What I'm saying is this is already happening today. Uh, what we need to rely on is that at any given point, 5% of the people are going to be doing the bad thing. And 95% of people of humanity is counterweight doing the good thing. It's always like that in every situation. These black hats will get more powerful tools. And then the people in the defense side, they will also get powerful tools. Again, the key is that people who do not adopt it, they will be at a disadvantage. And that again happens again and again. People with more resources, they will be able to adopt the latest technology faster. They will get more resources in turn. And then people who adopt it later, they'll be disadvantaged. So these right. kind of conversations, if people listen to these kind of conversations, they say, okay, we need to get ahead. That data is becoming more important. We need to adopt technology to progress our culture, our community. That will be advantageous to them. So I think the people who are afraid of the possibilities of AI for security need to do what you just said and buy better locks, basically. to so buy AI-empowered security systems that yeah, yeah. tap into it to stay ahead of the curve. I mean, and and those the solutions are available out there. The idea is if people are concerned, because 98% of the people when they show concern, they are not ready to do anything about it. So if they're concerned, the solutions exist out there, so they should do something about it, but not yeah. complain. Only The change only happens when they do something about it. It's one of those things, I think it's a bit more intangible, so maybe it's a bit more difficult for yeah. some people to understand. Yeah, yeah, else. that is, a, that is exactly. But yeah. that's it. If you want better sleep, don't look at your phone for an hour before you yeah. sleep and you'll have yeah. much better sleep. That's yeah. it. You don't need a exactly. pill. That's what exactly. you need. Yeah. What about regulation? Because... Again, if you're fighting AI with AI, then the law enforcement agencies need to implement it too, yes, which needs to be something that regulators push or at least budget for. What about 
the advance of that? What do you think about that? Part? See, in my opinion, in 15 years, I believe even the U.S. president will take advice from AI. Regulations, law agencies, they'll all start to adopt AI slowly. And there will be regulations needed in certain areas, maybe not. It's, it's like the internet, right? Internet is an open technology, but still there are some rules and regulations. Like you cannot just use the internet to do anything. Although it is pretty free area where you can do a lot of stuff, but still you cannot spread violence or things like that. Similar kind of regulations, I believe, will come into play on AI. And then there's going to be probably some algorithms which may have so many deep implications, they may be banned to certain agencies, certain organizations. So a lot of these kind of scenarios will start to originate for sure. Interesting. Okay. So we can expect the US AI national security advisor in the near term future. Absolutely. Absolutely. Interesting. Okay. So another example I think that is becoming more and more prevalent now is using deep fakes to cause harm. The obvious one is you take someone's whatever data that you have, you create a video of them doing something that isn't good and use that to destroy their persona, if you will. But one thing that I'm seeing more and more is actually scams that come from deep fakes where they take a video or audio of someone, use an AI model to regenerate it, create their own text, and then call someone in their family, like their grandmother is, a, is always the example, asking them, can you Venmo money? Can you send me money? Can you do this for me, please, grandma? Like, I'm desperate. I'm, I'm about to go to jail. And it's completely fake. It's from a block number, but they don't have the tech savvy to understand that. So they send the money, lose thousands of dollars. And obviously, that this is something that needs to be regulated and these AI models need to have a pin in that. But outside of that, what can people do to stop these kind of attacks from deep fakes? On the technical side, yes, there can be mechanisms put in place. For example, these days when you buy a product, let's say you buy an Apple product, sometimes you'll see a stamp of authenticity on it, something along those lines. And then technology may emerge, which can say, okay, authenticated by the user, signed by the user or something along those lines. These technologies are not new. Imitation has always been there. Now, it's just that it has become more accessible and easy for people to do. But countries have been employing very sophisticated spying technology for ages. So these things are not new. But now, how does society deal with it? Whether we trust each other enough that we say, okay, if I see a fake video of you, whether I'm going to blindly believe it and that becomes an epidemic or it just fizzles away, it will depend upon that. It becomes, if it becomes a big problem, like really big problem, then I believe there will be solutions like authenticity, signature, digital signatures, put right in the video, put right in the image or something along those lines. The idea is this, as new technologies come, they solve some problems, they create more problems. If those problems become big enough problems, that creates opportunity for other entrepreneurs to come and solve it and then generate money out of it. Okay. And uh so almost like a biometric footprint that goes into the yeah, videos. Yeah, yeah. What yeah. about audio though? Audio as well. Once again, I don't believe it is going to be an epidemic. Okay. We all joke about the prince of Nigeria who wanted to transfer $31 million to us, right? <laughs> we all joke about it. It used to be a big thing 20 years ago, right? Then 15 years it's, ago, right? I still get those emails, man. Yeah, I still yeah, okay, get okay. those emails. So they have upgraded their technology. But it's not like an epidemic that, oh, the whole society is collapsing because of that. They have duped people out of hundreds of thousands, but it's not like a big thing that somebody will say, okay, I'm going to find a solution to this. But if AI becomes a problem, then it creates an opportunity for somebody to say, okay, let me solve that for people. That makes sense. I think education plays a role too then. Just exactly. helping the elder, less technologically advanced the family members, telling them, look, if you get a random call, explain to them that this is a reality. And so don't send me money right away. Call me back yeah. on my number just in case. Yeah. So things like that, I think, could be happening. I think we should rely on a couple of things. One, common sense to prevail. Like, That's asking a lot these days. <laughs> That's asking a lot these days. <laughs> I know, but the second thing is trusting the good in humanity. When we read the news, we just said it's all sensationalized. We think the world is full of bad stuff. 
but only 5% is bad. 95% is pretty good. Let's focus on that first. That makes sense. It's not always the worst voices that are predominant. It's just that they're the loudest. Yeah. yeah and so exactly. because we hear them more, we think they're more realistic, yeah, but yeah. that's not always the case. Okay. Makes sense. I want to touch on one last fear that people are talking about a lot these days. And this is a bit more the people who know AI a bit more clearly. And it's on the transparency, accountability of AI systems. So obviously with the black box nature of it, everything is proprietary to the companies. So they don't want to share their algorithm and their details unless they open source everything. We don't know exactly what's driving their models and what's making things do the things they're doing. So when you think about AI systems for facial recognition, there have been proven bias shown towards people of color, for instance, when you're looking at other types of AI, recommendation AI can more likely have bias towards certain cultures, certain genres of music, for example. Again, we talked about the social media algorithms. They want to highlight the loudest voices rather than the largest number of voices that say the same thing. And it's almost like when you have a consistency towards something, when you have a feeling towards something, when you have a bias towards something, the AI refeeds that bias to you to validate that bias, even if it's not necessarily accurate. So what's the solution for this? Obviously, we are trying to create transparency within these organizations, be they social media, be they AI platforms, but what else can be done? See, the thing is, the answer comes back to the exact same thing. So let's look at it this way. The raw material for AI is data. AI is an algorithm which reads the data to understand what is the pattern that exists. So again, going back to our previous example, data is the valuable thing here. People who have the resources, meaning rich people or people who are forward thinking, they are producing more data and they are harvesting more data. So obviously their voices get reflected more in the AI algorithm. So it's a cycle of society which is happening all the time. People with more resources produce more resources, consume more resources, they continue to grow. The good thing is that so far, human society has been growing in this cycle based on physical resources. So it was very capital intensive for somebody with less mean to extract the physical resources like gold and copper and you have to set up a mine which takes a lot of money. But now you can digitally mine. You can do a, I'm not in favor of cryptocurrencies, but you can just invest a thousand dollars and literally digitally mine Bitcoin. So the barrier of entry to produce the valuable resource, which is data, is less. So the more people become digitally aware, the more people participate and embrace AI, the more they will be able to rise. And then when they produce that data, it will start to reflect and remove the bias. Because the bias is nothing else but a true reflection of how society is today anyways. So we need to fix the society and AI sure. can help. So it's that cycle. We have to use that cycle to equalize everything, which will then start to remove bias. That's easier AI. said than done though, right? And it's a lot easier. For it people. is. Yeah, 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 yeah. You mentioned wars in the beginning, and I love that as an analogy for this. We think about the world through the filter of our own traumas and past yeah. experiences and history. And so we almost reflect that onto the AI in a sense here. I think bias against people, yeah, that sometimes it's technical difficulties, but bias against people a lot of times is just, yeah. it's just something that exists in humanity. But exactly. what about the technical challenges? Okay, some, sometimes it can't capture color correctly and it becomes more difficult to see. See, the algorithm has no shortcoming. Algorithm is just looking for that data. It's just... The thing is, it's basically just looking for the most common pattern. So if the data is not there, then the only option is I artificially fudge the data and say, I'm trying to avoid using racial stereotype. But let's say you count 50 people and 10 of them are white, 30 of them are Indian and 10 of them are African. And if you want to remove the bias, in that real data, you have to decide as a human, okay, what do you want to do here? You want to make them one third because it doesn't represent the true reality, true, the true world. So that's what needs to happen in every field slowly. And then the data will reflect that. But that's the thing because everything is black box. Everything is proprietary. Everything is secret. We don't even know sometimes that this thing has a bias until it becomes a problem. 
Mm-hmm. So like facial recognition, it was being deployed in certain places and they didn't realize that it was flagging certain people more. And it's not always, they don't want to make it like a racial thing, but mm-hmm. it could flag people who are wearing orange t-shirts more than, than people who are wearing green t-shirts. Something as simple as that, because it somehow computes this because of data. I think this was something I read somewhere. It's like people were prison wear orange jumpsuits. So the data connected that information to yeah, the yeah. fact that they're criminals. So orange in its mind is bad. And like, we don't know that until it's flagging 100 people falsely who are just wearing orange. There are open source frameworks available. There are as many open source frameworks available. There's always going to be like this proprietary thing with every technology. There's always going to be bias. Once again, th- this is not any different than a human being. When I go through a security check, like... I can tell you that I get picked most of the time for the random check. Is that a coincidence or I can sense the bias? So the data is just reflecting that. And then uh, that's all I can say. If it, if it's a black box, it is reflecting the true nature. And not everything is a black box. There are open source things available. People can start using it. And building algorithms is not a big deal these days. A lot of these algorithms are based on standard research, standard theories. It's the data that is more precious. If you don't have the data, then how are you going to train the algorithm? And still, I'm not convinced though, to be honest, because again, the biggest facial recognition companies, all of them are black box. They don't share their coding with anyone. And if we are trusting them to manage security and they're flagging people, not based on skin color, but based on like orange jumpsuits or whatever else, because their data isn't calibrated properly. Like, how do we solve that though? I'm not saying there's not a problem, but what I'm trying to say is that first, we have to quantify how big of a problem that is. So we need to do that quantification and say, it, this company's algorithm is 0.5% favoring this race versus this race. And then you can compensate for all that. But I think we haven't got that data yet to be able to say how big of a pro- problem this is. There are rumors, there are things like that. But again, being a data scientist, I have not seen a study which says quantifiably how much... uh, uh, But it's difficult to have a study like that when they control the data. Even when you're doing models with OpenAI, for example, you have to give them the data set. They do the thing with it. They send it back to you. You have no idea what they might have done on the back end to change that. That's the the thing. It's a transparency issue more than it is a... No doubt about it. This uh, software to record this interview. We don't know Mm -hmm. behind the scenes what they are doing. What is the code? We're just using it. Now, if something goes wrong, let's say they put different faces on our faces and start selling this video. What are we going to do with the source code? We are using it in full knowing that I'm not interested in what is happening underneath the covers. If I'm comfortable with that, I can record this interview. If I'm not comfortable, then I'll say, I don't trust this. So I'll make another choice. That puts a good pin in it. I think this is the reality of doing business in anything. If you don't know how the sausage is made, even if you go into the sausage, you're not going to know what's correct and what's not. It could be chicken. It could be rats. You you just want to know. Exactly. Makes sense. Okay. It's the same with AI. Okay. 